All right, Nico, can you say welcome to another episode of Healthy Births, Happy Babies? It's a happy episode. Um, happy babies. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another episode of Healthy Births, Happy Babies. And when I say welcome back, I mean not just to you, but also to me. I have been on hiatus from producing content for the Healthy Births, Happy Babies podcast for almost six months now. If you're a regular listener, you know that. If you're new to the podcast, you're not going to see much of a gap (laughs) in between episodes. But I have been on hiatus because I've been concentrating on Uh, My other podcast, a dad's podcast, supporting new dads specifically, it's called The Dadhood Journey. If you haven't started listening to that, dads, please go find that anywhere you listen to podcasts, you'll find The Dadhood Journey there. But I am back, and the guest that's bringing me back out of hiatus is none other than Dr. Bob Sears. Um, We're going to have the vaccine conversation, and the vaccine conversation is... One that I think is a really important one for parents to have. It's a really important topic, um, an important health choice that you're going to need to make for your new baby. And Dr. Bob is really an authority in the field. And I've actually been emailing with him for a couple of years, literally a couple of years to have him on as a guest. But because of various reasons, schedules, political climates, certain happenings, it, the stars are aligned now for us to have this conversation. And he actually has a brand new podcast um, that, as of the time of this recording, has been out for a month. He's um, pumping out more and more content, giving you more and more information about this very subject. And his podcast is called The Vaccine Conversation. So we'll be referencing that a lot. I highly recommend you use that as a resource. We'll be referring over to it and putting links in the show notes over to it. Um, but he is here today to really help you as a new parent um, go through a decision a decision making process of like how to gather information what questions to ask um, and how to go about navigating this really important really complicated um, really significant health choice that you're going to be making for your kid and so I want you to do it um, with all the information that you need to make an informed choice. We're going to be talking a lot about informed choice. We're going to be talking a lot about um, different vaccines, um, the the risk-benefit analysis that we want every patient, every parent to go through so you make the right decision that you feel is the best for your kid. And I'm not saying that's to vaccinate them. I'm not saying it's to not vaccinate them. I'm not saying to do a delayed schedule. I just want to have you have all the information so that you can make a great decision for the health of your whole family. And that's what Dr. Bob's going to help walk you through. It's a great conversation. We go through tons of different um, topics. So before I switch over to our conversation, let me um, take a break for this message and I'll come right back and introduce Dr. Bob to you. My online course Connecting with Baby During Pregnancy has been out for a while now and I've been getting phenomenal feedback from you women who have been learning these prenatal bonding techniques, putting them to use and having amazing results. The same kind of results that The women in the Rafi study were getting where by doing these techniques throughout pregnancy, they were having less anxiety and pain during labor. They're needing less obstetrical interventions, including less C-sections. And then afterwards, the babies are sleeping better, which means you're sleeping better. And postpartum depression was less than 1% in the moms who did these techniques. So go over to my website at drjwarren.com slash CWB and learn all about it. I think this course is amazing. I put a lot of effort into it and I think it'll really help you have a healthier, happier, and more relaxed pregnancy and a gentler yet powerful birth. All 
right now. Dr. Bob Sears really needs very little introduction. I'm sure you're familiar with the Dr. Sears books. Um, Their family together has put out over 40 different titles, one of which, the baby book, was the Bible that I used as my Bible as a parent. And I did a book review episode on this podcast about it, but they have books about breastfeeding and healthy pregnancy and family nutrition, just great, great resources. And their website, Ask Dr. Sears.com is one of the most widely visited health resource websites there, especially for um, pediatric cares and kids' issues. Um, But Dr. Bob Sears, um, being with us today, he is a pediatrician in Orange County, California. He's the author of the vaccine book, um, one in that library of the um, Sears books. He's also the co-founder of the Immunity Education Group. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing objective and complete information on vaccines. His new podcast, The Vaccine Conversation with Melissa and Dr. Bob, provides a new outlet for his life's mission to provide every person worldwide with objective, truthful, and undoctored information on vaccines and infectious diseases. So, With no further ado, let me turn over to my conversation with Dr. Bob Sears. All right, Dr. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Hey, uh, thanks, Jay. It's uh, fun to be on the the podcast. I think this is my first guest podcast appearance that I can remember. Is that right? Well, I'm honored to to have you on as a, a, a really big fan of your new podcast that you launched. So congratulations on that. And yes, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, But, you know, it's almost been, I think, two years that we've been kind of emailing back and forth about coming onto this podcast. You were tops on my list to have you as a guest and uh, the stars have aligned now that we can have this conversation. So I appreciate you taking the time to do so. I'm very happy to do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, first off, I mean, we're going to be jumping into the vaccine conversation to borrow the title of your podcast. Um, But, you know, you come from such a long line of pediatricians, your whole family is a clan of pediatricians, and you've added so much knowledge, so much wisdom that have helped so many of my patients alone, let alone all over the world. So I want to acknowledge you and thank you um, for all of that. Um, All of the books, all of the resources are invaluable and have been for me as a parent as well. So thank you for that. Um, and I also wanted to ask, like, how did you, I mean, in a way, I guess the question should be, how did you not become a pediatrician <laughs> given the family you grew up in, but how did that all come about? What was it like growing up and what inspired you to kind of go into the family biz, if you will? Yeah, well, well, my dad, um, he told me you know, many years ago, I don't know, 30 years ago that he gave me the freedom to choose to be whatever kind of children's doctor I wanted to be. <laughs> So I'm kind of narrowed it down to only one field. And, uh, right. No, but I, I knew that's kind of what I wanted to do. And yeah. I, I just, I think, uh, yeah, I just said fit naturally. I mean, I, I'm so glad I did it because I, I mean, I love kids. I just love babies and kids and, you know, interacting with kids and, um, you know, checking them out in the office. I mean, it's just, I just, I don't know, I like it. I think I, I'm not annoyed by Mm-hmm. the things that kids do that would normally annoy a lot of people. Right. Well, and um, I think in your line of work, like if it did, you wouldn't be doing it for as many years <laughs> as you've done yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess not. And then and, and strangely, I, I like talking to parents about uh, mm-hmm. like all their, just uh, all their questions and the, you know, the, the things they would ask me about. And oh, I just, I, I find I uh, enjoy just sitting and chatting about, about things all day long. So Right. And now just, with your busy, busy practice, you're podcasting as well. So you're you're talking with parents, but also kind of in a more, I don't know, anonymous way and that you're not face to face. How did the podcast come about? Well, I um, I mean, I love uh, listening to podcasts and I've, I've uh, been listening for, I don't know, several years. And I've always thought it'd be so cool just to sit there and talk just for, you know, with, without necessarily a, a huge time limit. And um and uh, you know, Melissa and I started Immunity Education Group three years ago, uh, mm-hmm. three and a half years ago now, and just as a nonprofit to try to just help spread uh, information about um, about uh, you know vaccines and infectious diseases, and just kind of give you the the side of the story that you won't get from your uh, regular doctor usually. Um, <clears throat> but you know, Jay, and I don't know if you've done a lot of uh, social media writing. Um, 
it, it it's it takes a you put a lot of work into say creating a, a one page piece to put out as a blog on social media. Mm-hmm. And Melissa, I like I would write it. Melissa would fix it. <laughs> uh, you know, we would kind of sometimes we spend like two hours just talking about like one page of something just to try to make it perfect. And and I just thought, yeah, I mean, this is fun. We like it, but we love talking. I mean, those those couple hours we would spend talking about the piece seemed far more valuable than the actual piece we we finished mm-hmm. up with as right. far as yeah. the details we would talk about and and what would come out of you know the, the ideas that would come out of her mouth and just the, the just the medical information I knew I had I wanted to share and and I thought oh this would be so great if people could actually hear us talking about this uh, this piece and so I you know finally um just decided we would do it and uh, and um, I'm very happy we had we did because it just gives us a freedom just to talk and share every detail that we want in a, in a, in a fun way. And I think a way that reaches, reaches people who, uh, who, you know, wouldn't make, maybe always be reading blogs, you know, and I right. think the podcast audience, I think is a, is a great audience. I mean, um, they, they love hearing information, but they also kind of want to be entertained, mm-hmm. um, you know, educational entertainment, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of how it came about. Right. Well, and having listened to your episodes, like you do provide that, <laughs> both of it. I mean, tons and tons of information. And it will definitely become like one of the great library resources for my patients that are asking me questions about vaccines and to refer them to is fantastic. But you also, as you said, do it in a really entertaining way. You and Melissa have a very nice rapport. You have um, a good banter back and forth. And uh, it's it's a great conversation to listen in on. So um, it isn't dry, boring. It's, uh, it's very lively. And uh, the minutes just fly away. So great job on it. I'm impressed. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. And so let's let's dive into the vaccine conversation. Um, this is something that the parents I work with in my own office like have tons of questions about and are very hungry for information. And your book, the vaccine book, is one of the ones I reference um, them to to be able to find out information. And you know this this subject or this uh, episode, I should say, isn't going to be comprehensive by any means. It's just starting the conversation. What I really want in our conversation together right now is to lead a parent through kind of like the thinking process and the process that you would have a parent go through to become informed, to become um, well-versed on it so they can make an educated choice on it rather than kind of making a pressure decision or not really knowing anything about it and then having to backtrack afterwards. And that's something that you are very clear about in your, um, in your podcast, really talking about being pro informed consent rather than saying vaccines are bad or they're great. It's more of like, let's, let's get the information there. And you and Melissa made a really interesting distinction about informed consent, the kind of the doctor's version of what informed consent. And then also like, as it relates really to the patient, can you, can you revisit that for my listeners? Yeah, and and it's a great example, Jay, of uh, of um, kind of the the kind of things that would just come up in in our whole conversations. I'd never ever thought before about about informed consent from the patient standpoint until Melissa said it. Actually, right there on the podcast, that was she, you know we she didn't even you know tell me we we're going to go there, and mm-hmm. um, and so I, I thought it was very interesting. As a doctor, I always thought informed consent was was. Uh, when I share information with the patient, when I share them, you know, with them all the pros and cons of a decision, so that they can make an educated decision about something, it's like I'm giving them the information so mm-hmm. that they can like give me consent. Um, but Melissa turned it around, and I honestly never thought about it this way, but I think it's a more important viewpoint: is the patient has to receive all the right information so that they are actually giving educated informed consent to a procedure like they they're giving their consent for you to do something because they've been so well educated about it they feel comfortable about it they feel informed and they feel like they're they're making the right choice so it's like it's like th- they're giving me the consent to you know to do a medical procedure versus uh i'm like um giving them the information so to speak i mean it's i mean it's it's almost the same thing but mm-hmm. I guess I just had never thought about it looking at it from the patient's standpoint. Right. That they, you know, they're, they're not giving informed consent unless they have been informed. 
about it. Right. And, and have that. enough information for them to, as you say, right. like feel comfortable to give consent. Like the onus isn't on the doctor as much as it is the the patient, the parent to be able to have right. all the information. I think that's a great distinction because it empowers a patient to say, okay, well, I need more information in order to give this consent for a very important decision. Yeah. And, and I think um, I, the way I've sort of looked at vaccines in a little little different way in the last few years is that um, it, it almost feels like you automatically vaccinate in, unless you decide to opt out. Mm -hmm. Right. It's almost like the default decision that most people look at it is, well, of course, everyone vaccinates. That's kind of what you always do. And uh, there's really this kind of why even think about it and, and why even ask for consent or information because because you're just going to do it. And um, and what I think if you really look at informed consent uh, process, that's really not how you should look at it. You should basically look at it as the default position, so to speak. And you asked me, you sort of said you want to you want me to sort of guide parents through the thinking process. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to anything medical, the, the default should always be you're not going to do something. You're not going to engage in a medical procedure until you actually have read about it and understood it and you feel very confident about it. And then you actively go in and, and do and, and you know, uh, accept the medical procedure. And I think when it comes to vaccines, I think parents, instead of a, uh, you know, looking at it as, okay, I'll just automatically do it and I, I won't even investigate it because, of course, it's got to be safe and it's got to be the right choice. I feel like you really at least have to start off um, realizing it's a complicated, very invasive medical, you know, uh, intervention. In fact, it's probably the, the single most complex set of, of medical treatments your child will ever receive, possibly in his or her whole life short yeah. of chemotherapy or, or major surgery, um, the most you know invasive medical procedure your child will ever receive. So of course, why wouldn't you want informed consent about it? Why wouldn't you want information? So so kind of me, for me, it's, if parents are, are confused or they don't know what to do at the start, <clears throat> don't just go ahead and do it and then decide you're going to research it later. I think the, the default decision or the fallback you know, position is don't do it until you've had your, your information, your consent, and then you start doing it because you feel comfortable doing it. Right. Well, and I know that I'm sure you've heard this story a lot, too, is that a lot of the patients I work with, they, they feel like once they start asking questions, wanting to get informed, there's a lot of pushback, like right away and feeling yeah. like... The doctor is being challenged by um, this information and it sets, there seems to be in like an adversarial relationship setting up. And so parents are one scared to ask. Um, so I think something you advocate strongly for is to get informed and get all this information before you even go into the first visit so that it isn't the start of it. It's more of like a a fact finding fine tuning, which I think is a really great yeah. um, thing. But why is it? Do you think it's because vaccine, like just as you said, like is so the assumption is you're gonna do it that then once your that train is rolling, it's really hard to get off, and then doctors feel challenged by it. Not all pediatricians, but I would a, a large portion are are do feel that way, or parents relate that to right. me. Yeah, I, I think um, to me, um, I mean it's. To, to me, I think doctors who uh, who are very adamant about vaccinating and they'll really come down hard on you if you start to question it. I think a lot of it stems from the idea that, that uh, doctors actually think you are getting your information or your data, like from 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 an actor's blog or from mm. a from a from a granola journal, like some sort of natural medical news journal. Or you're you're reading information from like a doctor who is you know is you know lost their medical license, or um you know or or you're you're listening to like a, an actress who you saw on a news interview, that's where doctors think patients are mm. getting their information when they question vaccines, and you know and if that were true, I don't blame the doctors for uh, for being mad mad about it. Mm -hmm. um, Fair point. But but the, the reality is that's not where most people are getting their information. Um, when I talk to patients in my office, they're telling me, yeah, I've read all this CDC data. I've read public health department data. I've read um, 
you know, three books written by medical doctors. I've read uh, the, the vaccine package insert information. I've read all 100% completely scientific, you know, information. That's where my databases come from. And now I have a bunch of questions. Right. So, and so I think if, uh, if you want to start the conversation out correctly with your doctor and have them maybe be a little bit more accepting of you, um, start the conversation out that way. You know, tell them where you got the information so they, they know you're not just listening to some actor or actress. Um, you, you are using you know, you know, real, you're, you're getting the same information that they got and the same sources that they got. Right. You just maybe actually read the fine print a little more carefully mm -hmm. and, and now you have questions. I think that's a great place to start. Um, and um, you might get, you know, treated better by your doctor. Uh, um, but honestly, you know, if, you're right. You have to trust your doctor. And if you're not getting, if you're seeing a doctor who's not open-minded, honestly, don't waste your time trying to keep going back to that doctor and, 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 and expecting informed consent. Mm -hmm. um, you're just not going to get it. You, 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 do, you have to, the doctor has to be at least be willing to have a conversation with you. So um, don't fight a losing battle if, if your doctor's not open to it. Right. And, you know, it is the, just the schedule of medicine, the, the model of medicine, like a lot of doctors simply just don't have time to go f through yeah. all of that. And at the same time, I feel that's just not enough of an excuse to not get this information to parents or to at least discuss it. And I think I keep saying all the time to for anyone that you really employ on your healthcare team to take care of either yourself or your kid is you want to have that team congruent with how you want to discuss information, find out information, make choices. And if you're, if you're not feeling secure by that, then by all means, like find another doctor that will be able to have the conversation. You might not do anything different than you might've done with the other doc, but at least you will feel a team approach and a support rather than um, kind of being berated every single time you go in for your two, four and six month appointments. Yep. But I don't think a lot of parents realize they can do that. Um, I think they kind of think they just go to whatever doctor their insurance tells them, and they do have a lot more choice. Right. Yeah, or they think they're going to change their doctor's mind about it. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, the only thing you really need from a doctor is, is someone who will be accepting of someone who doesn't want to follow the complete vaccine schedule mm -hmm. and say you want to do less than the entire schedule. Or, you're, or you need a doctor who's willing to see you if you opt out completely. I mean, you need that kind of doctor if you're going to ask questions. Um, right. In Orange County, where I work, I, probably 98% of pediatricians in the entire county won't see you at all as a patient unless you do the entire schedule. Mm -hmm. So you would never get informed consent from that doctor because because if you don't consent, you're gone from their practice. <laughs> so they can't actually give you inform, you know, fair, balanced, informed consent because to them, there's only one answer. Right. So yeah. First, the first step is finding a new doctor who will talk to you about it. Right. And having that information, like just as you said, I want to back up to the current CDC recommended schedule. Um, the CDC mm -hmm. website has all the information you'd ever need to, or just start a conversation or to start questioning how you want to go about it, as well as the, the vaccine inserts. Um, and the fine print there. Um, and I think w in one of the episodes you had brought up this, that, that the CDC's recommended schedule, I think there's 69 different shots, um, different vaccines that are given over to the childhood of a kid. And that's through 18, but the majority are given in the first two years of life, right? Correct. Yeah, that is a recommended schedule, which in the we're both in the state of California and the um, political climate has changed where there is mandatory vaccinations unless if you have a medical exemption. But there is a difference between what's mandated by the state and then the the full CDC recommended schedule. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. The, the California law mandates about half of the childhood doses in order to attend school. OK. Yeah. And it, something that's being told to parents is that by doctors in their offices is that your kid can't go to school unless if you do these vaccinations, which is not true because there are still some exemptions. The, the, um, the other personal beliefs and the religious exemptions are no longer valid because of the law that went through a couple of years ago, but it's still possible for a child to see that it just, it takes more work. Um, and I think, 
going through that current CDC schedule, like there's so many more now on the schedule than there have been even in my generation. And I'm not, I'm not a spring chicken. I'm 46 years old. So I was fully vaccinated as a kid. Um, but I didn't receive nearly as much as my son who's five now, if he were vaccinated, um, to receive, like, how did that process change so radically in such a relatively short period of time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I love seeing on Facebook the pictures of a, like a grandma, a mom, and a child, and they're all holding up signs saying, I'm fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. and, and on the sign, it says what that includes. So, yeah, if you go back into the, the 60s and 70s and the early 80s, um, people got about eight doses of, um, of uh, just, just MMR, DTP, and polio, um, those like those three inject three injections uh, about eight total doses of them. Um, now we give um, now there's uh, twelve injections instead of just the three. It's a total of uh, sixteen vaccines because some of them are three and one, so it's mm -hmm. sixteen vaccines, and it's all given in about um, instead of those just those eight injections, it's all given in about uh, fifty two injections. And, and since a lot of them are three and one, it comes out to 69 doses. So it's really tripled since the uh, 80s. Mm. It's tripled um, the, the number of doses we give kids. In fact, I like to say, you know, the, the, the number of vaccines we gave people in, in the 70s and 80s uh, through their entire childhood, we now give that many doses in the first six months alone. Mm. Um, to babies. So think about uh, Jay. What, uh, what what say you or your parents got as kids? We now give that many doses to babies in the first six months of life, and I think parents need to realize that that right. that vaccine is not what it used to be. And I think we've reached a, a point where um where there's uh there's risk that needs to be understood before parents accept the entire vaccine schedule. Right, and I think in a in a thought process, like in starting to decide whether or not this is right for my child or not, there's two main questions as far as vaccines come up is, you know, the risk of injury, but then also like the benefit, like are the vaccines a, as beneficial as told, right? So before we even go into like, you know, say like measles and whooping cough, like how effective those um, vaccines are, let's first talk about like vaccine injury and the risk that's there. And the question that comes to mind is like, how do you know if your child is going to be at risk? Because there's plenty of children that have been fully vaccinated that don't have any apparent um, damage, if you will. But then there's other children that have severe reactions. And the question a parent asks me is like, well, how do I know? What do you, how do you answer that question to parents that ask that to you? Yeah, you know, honestly, I don't think we actually know yet right. um, how to figure out who has risk and who doesn't. Um, honestly, we don't know. There's, um, I mean, there are uh, there are definitely um, people working on like genetic markers and metabolic, you know, blood testing to try to figure out, you know, if you're going to be vaccine susceptible. Um, but but honestly, the science is not there yet, Jay. Right. We don't have science to screen out who's going to have those bad reactions. Um, so I think right, right now I, I, I look at family history. If, uh, if one kid in a family has a really bad reaction, I think common sense would say the other kids in that family could have a bad reaction. Same from like parent to child. Um, and um, so I think there, there are actually a number of scientists in the vaccine community who are interested in that topic and actually are eventually going to figure out how to, metabolically and genetically screen people right you know, uh, so, so in the future we'll know that i would say uh for now i i don't even really talk to patients about that so much as as far as i just sort of present the general risk right. that we know of versus maybe are you riskier as an individual it's just hard to tell right because with that it kind of just brings up the topic of like the one size fits all doesn't fit for any child because you just don't know like if, if your child is going to and unfortunately with starting like sometimes getting 
either an exemption or starting to slow down the um, the schedule only comes after a reaction's been had. And so like damage has already been done before something can be done to slow down. So that's why I think it's, as you said, it's very complex and it's a very important health decision every parent needs to make um, whether they vaccinate or not. Um, and because we don't really know who's going to be injured and who's not, um, it's, it's definitely worth a parent to do their due diligence. Yep, definitely. And as far as like the, the effectiveness of the, um, the vaccinations, we're talking about, you know, herd immunity um, is thrown out as a topic and there's, you know, objections that um, parents are fielding saying like, well, if I vaccinated my kid and it's not fair that yours don't and because you're receiving benefit because my kid's safe, like, can you, and that is all based on kind of like herd immunity type of concepts. Can you explain what herd immunity means and how it's talked about in the community? And so we can kind of go to the next step about these different vaccines. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, well, let me let me actually reverse that and go with vaccine effectiveness first because okay. that does I think it's important to understand that so then you can understand herd immunity. Um, uh, essentially, I mean, in my office, I give vaccines to people who who uh, who uh, want them and um, because I do think they work. Uh, a lot of people, or not a lot, but some people in the vaccine uh, uh, community feel like vaccines don't work and they they kind of fight against them because they think they're worthless they don't work at all um, mm. I, I i disagree i think they do work but they work in a variety of ways and they don't always work how you think they will so in in the public eye there's this misconception that every single vaccine gives you this completely magical bubble of protection around your entire body so you'll never catch the disease and you'll never pass it to anyone else Right. And that is so far from the truth. Um, uh, some vaccines only work by um, making the disease less severe for you if you if you're exposed the disease, to the disease. But you're still going to catch the disease and you're still, still going to be contagious to other people around you. You'll just feel less sick. Okay. That's one way vaccines work. And um, then another way vaccines work is they some might actually give you enough immunity so you don't actually become contagious and you don't actually feel that you even ever were exposed to the disease. Um, <clears throat> that's another type of vaccine. Um, and so when, when you have the herd immunity argument, it kind of depends on what vaccine you're talking about. Um, okay. So I guess um, for me, uh, that, that's why I will say, you know, like, like let, let's just start with the whooping cough as an example. Um, the whooping cough vaccine is one that does not stop you from catching the disease and, and developing symptoms and spreading it to other people. It just makes your cough less severe. Okay. So you don't even, you might not even know you have whooping cough, but you're still going to spread it around. So like that's a vaccine that doesn't have any herd immunity argument because the vaccine doesn't protect the herd from the disease spreading around. It only protects individuals. Hmm. So they don't, they don't feel sick. And what's uh but on the other hand, say a measles vaccine is a vaccine that will give the vaccine recipient, um, if the vaccine works, it's going to give you a level of immunity that is likely to make it so you don't even catch the disease. Okay. So then you're not even contagious to others around you. All right. Mm -hmm. So that is a herd immunity argument when it comes to the measles vaccine. Okay. Uh, so it really kind of depends. And then. It, well, I, I hate to see these blanket statements or say uh, laws that, that a state will pass that mandates vaccines uh, when that vaccine doesn't even play a role in herd immunity. Um, so like the whooping cough vaccine that they mandated for all school children in California, along with the tetanus and diphtheria vaccine and the polio vaccine, um, they mandated those for school children, even though those four vaccines don't play a role in herd immunity. Hmm. So it's it's kind of, I mean, I almost wish I could I could go up to the you know go to the legislators who are passing these laws and say, okay, if you're going to pass a law to mandate a vaccine, you at least have to restrict it to the vaccines that play a role in herd immunity. Right. But why are you mandating a vaccine that doesn't play a role 
and herd immunity. I don't um, think most parents know that whooping cough, just as you said, is like is it just lessens the severity of it. Right, I think right. most people think like that. Okay, I got the shot. Like, how could I get whooping cough? I know because again, like I said, the the, the public's impression is every single vaccine gives you this magical level of protection in every way that you would want a vaccine to protect you. Right. And it doesn't. Um, and so it's, it, but it doesn't make the vaccine worthless. It just means as an individual, you might opt in for the whooping cough vaccine. So your, your disease course is it does severe, right. but it has nothing to do with you know, what your neighbor is deciding to do when it comes to whooping cough. Right. Same with the flu shot. The flu shot is another shot that doesn't prevent you uh, from catching the germs and spreading it. It just makes you maybe makes you feel less sick. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so I guess when it comes to you know, herd immunity, um, I mean, my, my take on herd immunity is that uh, people think like it totally doesn't exist and it's a myth. And, like like people, I guess, who, who fight against the vaccines or who fight against right. mandates, they'll say herd immunity is a complete myth. I think it's better to explain, well, which vaccines don't play a role in herd immunity. So you can kind of move on from arguing about those vaccines. But um but uh, but there's somewhere it does play a role. Um, but you know, you, you asked me initially to kind of start with the herd immunity uh, aspect of this question, and I'd like to point out uh, a way that I look at it a little bit differently, and I'll try to be brief. But to me, it's not about whether or not herd immunity exists mm -hmm. um, or doesn't exist. To me, it's about uh, the model of natural uh, herd immunity versus artificially vaccine-induced herd immunity. And that's kind of, I think, a better way to look at it. And yes. um, I'm, I'm going to use the, the disease measles, for example. Um, the, the, natural, uh, the natural herd immunity model is, is in a population that doesn't use measles vaccine. So all the kids catch measles, every single child catches it, and every single child gets lifelong immunity, all right? And, okay. and, and tragically, one in about 10,000 cases will be fatal. All right, mm -hmm. which is tragic, but that the 9,999 children who were in which it's not fatal, they develop lifelong immunity. So then all those adults are completely immune for their life, and all the women grow up to be immune while they're pregnant. So then you give birth to babies who are then immune to measles, so we don't have any babies catching measles. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, and then those babies grow up to be kids, and then they catch measles because their 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 immunity from their mom wore off. And then the cycle continues. That's kind of the natural herd immunity model. Okay. When you when, when you opt in for vaccination, what you do you essentially stop all the kids from catching measles, um, and uh, so none of the kids grow up with any lifelong immunity. So now you're actually leaving the entire adult population completely susceptible to measles, mm -hmm. and that's when the disease is more severe. So now you're creating much more like d severe disease opportunities for, for adults in the population because they have no natural immunity. Okay. Then those pregnant moms go through their nine months of pregnancy. And I know you, you talk a lot about pregnancy in your podcast. All these pregnant moms have no natural immunity and their vaccines have worn off. So what if that pregnant mom catches measles? Now she's put in danger and then she's giving birth to a baby with no measles protection. Um, uh, uh, because she has no vaccine and immunity. Now we're, we're, we're making babies who live the first year of their life with no measles immunity. And, and measles is, is most severe for young babies. Okay. So instead of allowing measles to occur naturally in, in, in kids where the disease is the safest, we're allowing the, these, these, these pockets of, of uh, susceptible individuals in our, in our society now, the adults, the elderly, the pregnant moms, and the new babies, it's kind of like the vaccine program has actually essentially created these higher risk groups when you opt in for a, like an artificial vaccine style of, of herd immunity. Right. Uh, and I'm not saying which model is best, when, mm -hmm. you know, which model, you know, is it better to do, you know, artificial immunity or natural herd immunity? I'm not saying which is best. I think it's just interesting to look at this because there's pros and cons on both sides of, of, of the herd immunity versus natural immunity debate. 
Right. And that's largely like what was happening with chicken pox. Like in my, in my generation, like we had chicken pox parties, you know, but talking to my parents, it was like the measles parties, you know, where as kids are like, Hey, somebody on the block got it. Let's go over and play with them so we can get measles over with. And the same thing was true with chicken pox, but now that chicken pox is on the schedule. Um, and to my knowledge and correct me if I'm wrong, like it isn't that chicken pox has become more deathly, it's just, no, no, it's, no. it's the same chicken pox that I got as a kid. It's just as a convenience, it's thought we can have a vaccine so the kids don't have to have it. Right. And, you know, that my, this herd immunity, you know, natural versus artificial, that whole uh, discussion uh, also applies to the chicken pox disease versus the vaccine. It applies to the rubella vaccine and disease. It also applies to mumps. All those childhood diseases people used to catch um, there is kind of a, a drawback to, to opting into artificial herd immunity because we create all these susceptible adults. And, and but you're right, your point about chickenpox vaccine is what I, where I think we've gotten away from the original purpose of vaccines. The original purpose was let's eliminate these horrible, deadly, dangerous diseases that are killing people or maiming people like smallpox and like right. um like uh, you know tetanus if you have a bad injury or uh, um, what diphtheria used to do or um, polio. polio um, right. That was kind of like the original intent. Now it's more like if we can figure out how to make a vaccine for anything, then it's going to be accepted and adopted on the schedule and we're going to make you know, billions of dollars. Mm. It's almost like like the, the old movie Field of Dreams. You know, if we build it, they will come. You know, <laughs> right. If we, right. If we can make yeah. a vaccine, they'll, they'll come in droves and get it. And and even something like chickenpox, whereas a lot of parents will opt out of the chickenpox vaccine, um, there's almost a blame if you don't opt in for everything. Right. You know, you're, you're looked down upon if you don't opt in, even for the vaccines that are for the you know, the mildest of diseases, um, because the, the media kind of has to play this role of of trying to convince everyone to get with the program, um, regardless of the logic of, of each individual vaccine decision. You just have to get through the, with the whole program. Otherwise, you're a bad citizen. Right. Well, and, I, and then I'm really glad that you went through that whole discussion of the different versions of herd immunity, because what we even talked about beforehand was it's believed that if you got with the program and everybody got with the program, then nobody would get any of these sicknesses or illnesses, and which just isn't true. Right. Right. With... with um. You mentioned about the the flu shot. Um, that is something that is the pregnant population that I work with. That's definitely on the list of decisions that are making, along with like um, other vaccines during pregnancy. Um, where would you recommend, or what would you recommend, a pregnant woman um, looking into finding out information about those, or what can you share about that in in that decision making process, rather than for the kids, but for her during the pregnancy? Yeah, yeah. Well, and we'll do a podcast episode on that. That's in our queue of topics specifically Great. during pregnancy. Um, um, and, and if I guess if someone wants to listen right now, they, they, we have a two-part flu episode. You can go back and listen to our, our flu podcast where we go into a lot of these details. Um, essentially, um, the idea is that they, they think the flu is more dangerous to pregnant women than non-pregnant women. Mm-hmm. And so they, they, they kind of are really adamant that every single pregnant woman should get a flu vaccine because otherwise she'll die if she catches the flu. And scientifically, that's not true. That they they don't have the research to to show that the flu is really any different for pregnant women than than non-pregnant women. So I'd say that's kind of not a val- really a valid reason to get it um, to get the shot. Um, the the other issue with the flu vaccine is um, uh, they they've done so many research studies to try to prove the flu vaccine is useful in pregnant women. But there's really only one research study that that was a large study where they did like randomized controlled trials, kind of you know uh, comparing uh, women who who were vaccinated for the flu during pregnancy compared to women who were not vaccinated for the flu, and in a really you know controlled way. And the only there's only one research study to go on to make this decision, hmm. and that that study it it showed you know, getting the flu vaccine might be helpful. Um, 
for you if you're pregnant. It might reduce flu complications if you're pregnant. It might maybe make your baby a little bit safer during pregnancy, but the, the science is really not strong on it. It's a very, it's kind of a soft call so far. We really don't have good scientific data to prove the vaccine is, is uh, useful during pregnancy. Um, so that's, that's usefulness. Now, as far as risk, um, we really do not have safety data on flu vaccine in pregnancy. We really don't. Um, mm. Because there's no way to, to physically examine fetuses and, and they don't physically examine newborn babies to look for any harm from the flu vaccine. They're not examining like newborn babies' immune systems or their neurological health. You know, we, we don't know, they, they never compared babies who are born to women who get a flu vaccine compared to babies who are not um, in, in, any, in any close way. So we really don't have any flu uh, safety data on getting the flu shot during pregnancy. So I think my warning to pregnant women would be kind of, I guess, you know, caveat emptor, you know, I think the buyer needs to be aware that um, the need for it is, is not really that high and the safety data is, is really lacking. So you're really making a decision, uh, uh, you know, w w really without good data. Right. Okay. So I, I, I tend to not recommend the flu vaccine to pregnant women um, just simply because of a lack of data. Right. And I'll, depending on when you listeners are listening to this episode, um, those episodes on Dr. Bob's episode or a podcast might be out already. So it'd be great to um, oh, reference yeah. into that yeah, as they're coming out. Um, but, that, and without having that kind of information about the, the flu shot in pregnancy, it also, I want to circle back, like there really isn't any information, um, safety studies on a baby receiving many different doses at one time of any of these things, right? There's safety, um, data around each individual one, right? But not when you're given these multiple doses. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of my whole um, my whole argument about the the media soundbite that says vaccines are safe and effective. You know, you always hear that all the yes. time. Uh, and um, what 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 I think the consumer needs to realize is um, when you say vaccines are safe, what you really mean is they have been put through the FDA designed safety trial process where they gave that vaccine to to a bunch of people, and and you know tabulated all their side effects and they, they decide, okay, enough people did okay with this vaccine uh, to, you know, to make sure to say for us to declare it's safe in quotes um, uh, and safe enough to use in the general population. That's kind of what they really mean by safe. Um, that's where the, the research really ends. Uh, and then they, they study each vaccine individually and then they study vaccines in some sort of, in some combinations Um but, but that's where the safety research ends. The, what, what people need to be aware of is there, there is no long-term safety research on our complete vaccine schedule. And no scientist can say our vaccine schedule of 69 doses is safe and effective. You can't scientifically say that. So you can say vaccines are safe and effective until you're blue in the face. But, but scientifically, what you mean is this individual vaccine is safe. Uh, you, you know, you, you cannot say in any scientific way whatsoever that our CDC schedule of vaccinations is safe, either in the short term or the long term. You definitely can't say it's safe for the long term because we don't have any long term safety research on it. Mm -hmm. But there's no there's no uh, short term safety research on it either. And mm -hmm. and even you know, the other the mainstream medical organizations that do this kind of research, they've admitted that um, they're not going to say that. I mean, you're never going to see the CDC or any doctors admit, hey, our our research our schedule has not been researched to be found safe. They're only saying, Jay, that vaccines are safe. Right. Because they have the FDA backing on that statement for their individual vaccines. So they're not lying to you. They're just not telling you, uh, being upfront with with all you know all the information that you should know. Right. Well, and with our kind of the last topic I wanted to um, ask you about is exemptions um, and how a parent would go about that. And every state is different, obviously, and I have listeners from all over the world, so it might not necessarily apply. But um, California is very different in that there's mandatory um, vaccination um, policy 
currently at the time of this recommend or uh, episode that I, hopefully that may be changing but as far as a parent going about either going for an exemption either in a medical sense in the california or elsewhere um, where would they find information about doing that is that something that can only be done through um, their pediatrician or is it something that they can have on hand on their own um you know, you you basically, I mean, there, there's no list anywhere of doctors who will who will provide medical exemption evaluations. Um, you 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 have to go online, search on social media, um, on groups that tend to talk a lot about vaccines. You'll get uh, you'll get you can get referrals to doctors that do exemption evaluations. Um, essentially, in California, the law says that um, if a doctor determines that vaccines are not going to be safe for your child. Um, based on your child's medical circumstances or your family's medical circumstances, including uh, your family history, um, then that doctor can judge that vaccines are not safe for your child and can give you a medical exemption. Mm -hmm. um, that's all that the law says. There, there are no like further guidelines that really break it down to exactly what that means. It, it's really up to the judgment of your doctor. And so you will have to find a doctor, first of all, I guess don't just go to random doctors and ask them for medical exemptions. I guess first start with your own doctor. Right. If the doctor doesn't do those kinds of evaluations, don't just randomly go around. You actually have to go to a doctor that specifically does those evaluations. Um, because if your doctor, if if you go to a doctor who specifically doesn't already do those exemption evaluations, they're not going to suddenly do it for you. Right. You know, they're, they're not going to even know how to do it. So you have to go, you have to call ahead and call around, ask friends, get referrals on social media about about what doctors are doing this, and then and then you go and and uh, I mean, in general for me basically if if a if I see a child who had a really severe vaccine reaction, yeah, I will I, I will consider that child may be exempt from from any more vaccines, and and I may consider that their siblings should also be exempt from vaccines because their siblings share that genetic risk. And I'll kind of uh, give that same exemption status to like uh, children if one of their parents had a very severe vaccine reaction. Um, to me, that all makes sense. And uh, but, but Jay, some, some families like have never even vaccinated, so they don't even have any severe reactions to go on in order to determine an exemption. And in those cases, if those families have three or more relatives who had really, really severe reactions, then yeah, I might consider exemption in those cases. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, I mean, some doctors will do exemptions for easier criteria than, than, than those, but that's kind of my general approach to it. Right. And I know, and just as you said, that kind of asking around in the community for, you know, who's open to a delayed vaccine schedule, I think is a good recommendation of where to start, you know, rather than saying like who, who writes medical exemptions, you know, um, is a great right. way of starting. And I know in San Diego, there's in, in this community, there's a handful of doctors that I will recommend to people to, um, start that process. And they're very, actually in my experience, they're very rigorous. They're looking at family health history. You have to submit medical records, um, to validate that there is a risk in that sense. And it isn't, yeah. you know, it, commonly thinking like oh you have a medical exemption like oh do you find it like somebody on the internet that would just like write you a piece of paper like it's it's not done like that it has to be done by a medical doctor and i have an, a medical exemption for my son we chose the um not to vaccinate him and his in his family history on both sides there's reason to believe that he might be at increased risk and so yeah. it can be done in that way um and depending on your state that it might a medical exemption might not be as um, might not be the only way that you can send your kid to school or to not vaccinate them. It might be the personal beliefs exemption, which we had when my son was first born, but has changed now. Yeah, there are, you know, Mississippi and West Virginia and California are the only three states that have mandatory vaccine laws for all schools. Um, Maine is trying to pass that law now. Mm. Um, that law was, they tried to pass that law in, uh, in Oregon and I think Washington and it, it failed. And they, they tried to pass it in Virginia last year and it failed. Um, I think they've tried to pass it in Texas. Uh, 
I mean, essentially, Jay, they're going to try to pass these laws in every state. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think um, the, the reason they think these laws are, are so unnecessary is, first of all, there's no health crisis. We have no increase in any vaccine preventable diseases. Measles is not increasing. It's just there, you know, up and down a little bit. We have no polio. Um, uh, we have no disease crisis that warrants, like, exercising extreme police powers by mandating medical interventions. Um, the diseases we are having problems with, like whooping cough, that's not a vaccine preventable disease as far as, as you now know, you know, that vaccine doesn't prevent the disease from spreading around. Right. Legislators will use the spread of whooping cough in order to pass mandatory legislation because they'll say, see, diseases are going around. We got right. to all this. Um, so, you know, it, it's not necessary. Um, and mandatory, you know, vaccine laws, in my opinion, won't even work to, to reduce uh, these little outbreaks that we do have. Like, for example, when measles went around in California um, in 2015 through Disneyland, mm-hmm. there was not a single case that occurred in any schools at all. Not one case of measles in any mm-hmm. school right. in California. And then the, yet that's when they passed the law. That's what made them pass the law. Yeah. And um, it happened so quickly. Yeah. So quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, then, and then to me, you just can't mandate something that has risk. There, there is there is uh, there is vaccine risk. There's risk of side effects. Right. And then how can you mandate anything like that? Um, uh, you know, especially if it's not always going to work, and especially if it's not needed. Right. Like it bugs me. They they mandated so many vaccines that you you shouldn't mandate for kids, like hepatitis B, um, and uh, and the vaccines that don't you know prevent the spread, like polio and whooping cough, tetanus, diphtheria. I mean, why mandate things that make no sense? And so. To me, mandated vaccines are, are unconstitutional. They're unethical. We shouldn't have them in any states. Um, and that's kind of why I'm speaking out more than I used to. Right. Because now it's not just about, uh, you know, uh, making your own choice. Now you are kicked out of school and considered a second-class citizen with fewer rights. Right. If you don't, you know, buy into the, the total, you know, complete medical model that... Uh, that the government wants to mandate. And I just think that's that's wrong for any society. Right. No, I agree with it you. Any society you know, down a dark path when you start going that way. Right. It is a slippery slope. And when when this went through, like it, to me, in my mind, it became less of a public health issue as it became a civil rights issue with me as a parent not being able to decide for my child what medical interventions they receive. And um, we'll just have to see, like, keeping our finger on the pulse of how things are going if it continues in a direction where more and more of those rights are taken away or if uh we kind of come to some senses and allow it to scale back time will tell right yeah yeah time will tell right. and and you know what um i feel like um uh even people who are who are very much in favor of vaccines and people you know people who vaccinate their kids i feel like I, I feel it and hope that at least they, you know, knowing that there's no disease crisis and that most vaccines don't prevent the spread of these diseases, I feel like that even those who support vaccinations would su- would be against mandates, mm-hmm. and that you know, they and and those of us who are fighting against mandates really make up, I think, the majority middle ground of of, of Americans who feel like no medicine should be mandated. And um, and so I almost would, you know, would like to see us all work together on this, yes. um, to not let the government and you know the uh, pharmaceutical companies who they certainly do donate a lot of money to government officials to to help lobby for their bills to pass you know mandated medicine. I think we should all be against that as uh, as free Americans, and then you make your vaccine decisions independently of, of there being any laws. Right. No, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I think that for all parents listening, really, the job is to start getting more informed, you know. And so in the last couple minutes, I just want to make sure that um, 
you parents listening, like I will put links to one to Dr. Bob's web or uh, podcast, uh, the vaccine conversation. You can find it everywhere that you listen to podcasts and in addition to where you're listening to this one right now. <laughs> but I also want to put a link um, to your um, website, the immunity education group dot org. I'll put that in the show notes as well. So you um, have that as a resource to either start your process as a um, parent looking at this for your child or even for yourself when we're talking about flu vaccines or um, during pregnancy um, so that you're informed you can have discussions with your medical provider and then hopefully find a, a provider that um, gives you that information so you can make that really informed choice so dr bob thank you so much yeah. for being here i really appreciate it is there anything in closing you'd like to add I guess I just want to say, I guess, um, you know, looking at, you know, looking at our immunity education group uh, website, um, I mean, I, there, there's two articles on there where any new beginners to this, to this idea can start um, under our information center. We have, we have about uh, five pages that are all about the, the vaccines and the infectious diseases they're designed to prevent. It gives you like a like you can all you can read it in like a half hour. It just gives you a nice introduction to this idea, and then there's you know an article of vaccine side effects and the ingredients of those vaccines, and it gives you an equally quick, easy to read but complete picture of this. You know, start there. You got to start somewhere. You know, you can't always read a whole book, right? Um, right. But you can always you know, peruse the you know the entire CDC website if you want to just go to one place to get the like easy introduction. We have it very simply on our website, and then you expand your research all over the internet from there to yeah to get informed. Great, I'll put um, specific links to those. I can see them right now in front of me. That I'll put those links as well, so people can get get the information they need. Yeah. Yep. All right, Bob. Thank you so much again. I appreciate you taking the time to share this information and just keep doing what you're doing. I really appreciate yeah. you for what you're doing for our families. I will, Jay. It's a lot of fun doing it, especially podcasting. That's where the fun is. Yeah, you know, it is. A lot it more is. fun than writing. So I'll this <laughs> for a long time. All right. Take good care. All right. All right. Bye. Hi, it's Dr. Jay again, and I want to thank you so much for listening to the podcast. It's something I really enjoy doing, and I, as a parent, learn a ton from these experts coming on and sharing their wisdom. So I hope you're getting a lot out of it, too. And I want to share something else with you. I've created a guide called the 40 Ways to Connect with Your Baby During Pregnancy. It's full of simple things you can do on a day-to-day -day basis that will help strengthen that bond that you have with your baby. It's a free download. You can go to my website at drjwarren.com slash 40 ways and just enter your email. I'll send it right to you. You can download it and start working on it right away. All of the research that I'm learning in the fields of epigenetics and attachment parenting is showing that the more bonded you are during your pregnancy with your baby, the better the birth is going to go and the better parenting is going to go because you have that strong foundation, a strong connection to build upon. So go again to my website. It's drjwarren.com slash 40 ways and get that free guide. And again, thanks for listening.